Yes, you have. Now, if I don't make any more sound, <laughs> Mojo will find her way to the far side of those sheep. And when she's in a position that will send them towards me, then she will approach. If I don't make any more sound, she should reappear on the far side of those sheep. And these sheep, the sheep she should send in my direction. Yes, I crossed my fingers. <laughs> I don't know if you could see, but there was a dog, border collie that just ran down there to collect the sheep to bring them up to us to be able to see them. Without making sound, she should just send them towards us, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, so when she gets left, and here they come. And there they come. Here come the sheep. <laughs> Lay down. Go to her right. We need to stop. Forward. Making sound, she just starts to send the sheep towards me. <laughs> <laughs> right down. I'm going to start by trying to explain how, right down, how and why this works, first of all. So, again, if you have a look around you, I've been making loud sounds now with the whistle. There are sheep across the road in front of us, there are sheep right behind you inside in the shelter there, there are sheep outside in the field to your right. None of the sheep around us have reacted, so it's not the sounds even that will make the sheep respond. It's just the presence of the dog that make the sheep stop what they're doing, move around like this, and get into this bunch. So that's the first reason we use the dog. Number two, Mo has not made any sounds of these sheep to make them move. So the sheep aren't moving out of fear of barking or noise. And I'm sure you've all encountered sheep along the sides of the road in Ireland. We have parts of Ireland, we have sheep that lie in the very middle of the road and they just refuse to get out of the way. So if we have a dog that just barks at the sheep, the sheep will get used to that after a while and they'll just ignore it and we're stuck. And number three, so far, Mo has not made any contact with these sheep. So the sheep are not moving out of fear of being bitten or being hurt. The only time the dog will ever make contact with the sheep is if the sheep become stubborn if they refuse to move, if they refuse to move quickly enough, or even if the dog senses that they're questioning their authority in any way, <laughs> the dog will run up against the side of the sheep and nudge them along. They might give them a small little nip or a bite. They will never injure the sheep. They will always get them to move. And 99.9% .9 of the time, it's done with that stare. <laughs> it's all about those eyes, that stare, and that predatory walk. walk. That's enough to send a message to the sheep. The sheep just respond by moving away. Walk, 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 walk. Lie down. Lie down. So it's all 
about those eyes, that chair, and that wall that sends that message to the sheep. Okay, I'm going to let these sheep get away for a second, I'll do more. Just to try and show you the fourth reason we use the dog. So number one, the sheep move into a bunch. Number two, it's not by noise. Number three, it's not by aggression. The fourth reason is the main reason we use these dogs. And that is that these dogs are herding dogs. Okay, what I mean by that, even at the beginning here, these sheep were down here on our far left hand side. When I asked Mo to go and get them, she didn't leave me and run directly towards the sheep and scatter them everywhere. She went out around them quietly in a very wide arc. And as I said, when she gets to the other side of them, approach them to send them in my direction. When I stopped making sounds at Mo just a few minutes ago down the field, she didn't leave the sheep down there. She brought them right up here beside me. And I'm not sure if you noticed, but even when I was talking, she was she never took her eyes off them. And even when they started to move, she moved a little bit there. She is never happy unless these sheep are coming in my direction. And she's not 100% happy unless they're as close to my feet as she can possibly get. Okay. That's really what she wants to do. So I'm going to ask her to go and get these sheep again. But instead of me standing here this time, when they come up the next time, I'm going to start moving around a little bit. And if you watch her movements, all of her movements are in relation to where I am, where I move to, how the sheep move around me. All she ever really wants to do is get in front of the sheep and make sure they stay beside me. Okay, so I'll ask her to go and get them again. We'll ask her to go the opposite way this time. She'll find her way around the sheep, and as I said, when she gets to the other side of them, right. she should start to approach them and send them in my direction. And then we'll take it from there. Oh, find the place that's going to send them in my direction and then start to approach them. <laughs>
You can also see that Moe worked as hard as she possibly could to keep those sheep around me, bring them towards me. Do you think it's taken me a long time to teach her that? <laughs> no. I haven't taught Mo any of what you've just said. All border collies are born knowing how to do that. That is the natural instinct of all border collies. Their instinct is to herd, and their natural instinct is to herd towards us. Not just with sheep. They'll do this with hens, ducks, geese, sheep, goats, cows, horses, anything that moves, really. <laughs> they'll herd, and their instinct is to herd them towards us. And that, to me, is like a safety aspect. You might not believe this, but not every day in Ireland is like this. <laughs> <laughs> we go to the mountains every day to check on our animals. The only way to know that all the sheep are healthy and well is to go up there, move them around like this, and make sure they're all okay. If the mist or rain or fog comes down at any stage, if we ever lose sight of the dogs or we lose sight of the sheep, we never have to worry. We always know the dogs will come back to us, and they will always come back to us. It's their instinct. Of course, the problem with that is I can't guarantee they'll come back with my sheep. <laughs> they will come back with somebody's sheep. <laughs> she doesn't care if they're my sheep or the neighbor's sheep. All she wants to do is play with sheep. And the more sheep she gets to play with, the happier she is. <laughs> and if we never taught the dogs anything at all, they'll do exactly like you've seen. All border collies know how to do that. They have to spend a little bit of time learning, but they, that's their instinct. I don't always want the animals to come towards me, and I don't always want the animals to stay around my feet. But when the dogs are around one year old and they're moving around the sheep like you've just seen, as they move around the sheep, we start to make sounds. And they move it. That is our sheep. So as the dogs move around the sheep to their left, we make a sound. As the dogs move around the sheep to their right, we make a different sound. And eventually they learn that the sounds we're making mean the different direction. I've been standing here now for a few minutes, you can see she's getting a little impatient. But I've said the words left and right a few times. It means nothing to Mo. Mo doesn't understand what left or right means. Way and right. Lie down. Lie down. Come by. Means left. Lie down. Lie down. Way is right. Lie down. Come by. Is left. Lie down. Come by. Lie down. Right down. <laughs> left or right. Mo doesn't understand left or right. That's good. Right. One of our other dogs does understand left and right. Another dog is taught in the Irish language. Every dog has their own set of sounds, both by voice, that'll do more, and whistle. By teaching all the dogs the different sounds, we can work with as many dogs as we want all at one time, which means we can work with as many sheep as we want all at one time. One dog will easily and happily work somewhere around 100 to 120 sheep. Once we go over that, we use a second dog. Two dogs will work somewhere around 300 sheep. Once we go over that, we use a third dog. Four. Can anybody remember the words I was using for right and left? Way and come by. Shout a bit louder. Way. Me. Come by. <laughs> Not looking good, is it? <laughs> She'd work for my dad, my wife, anybody she knows around the farm. Any sound, any voice she doesn't know, she just won't respond. That's not male voice versus female. That's not the Irish accent versus anything else. That's just a complete bond of trust and companionship. Once they have that bond, they'll work. And if they don't, they just won't. People often ask me, do I train dogs for other people? I don't. I do travel around the world at times helping people train their own dogs. It's much easier for the person to train their own dogs than me making and breaking that bond to do it for them. Okay. And again, she's been listening. Anybody want to shout to her again? <laughs> Try it once more. Yeah. Wait. Wait. She's listening just for her own sounds. All the time. Once we've taught the dogs left from right, then we can attempt to move the sheep anywhere we need them to go. On the mountains, lay down more. 
We try and guide the sheep to paths that are less steep and safe to get them down the mountain, lie down. Here in the fields, if I wanted to move these sheep from here to the fields around us across the roads, I'd want the roads to make sure there's no traffic coming and the dogs will try and guide the sheep out through all the gates. And that'll do right. So I'm going to try and show you how we move the sheep around, but obviously on a much smaller scale. You can see two little sets of white gates down the bottom of the field here, one on the right and one on the left. I'm going to try and move this group of sheep down through one set of those gates, across the bottom of the field, and back to us through the other set, just with the same sound that they've heard so far. Okay. And I'm not sure if you noticed already, but all the movements the sheep make, they're normally facing away from the dog. Sheep's eyes are on the side of their head. They can see behind them and in front of them at the same time. So just by the dog moving behind the sheep, they should be able to direct them where to go. And I'm just going to say we haven't had questions, we haven't had many questions at all this morning. Okay, but one question we haven't had, and I have had many times before, but not today, and that is, Martin, why do you bother training the dogs? Would it not be a lot easier to train the sheep instead? Okay. <laughs> it's impossible to train a sheep to do anything. But just in case any of you think I could train these sheep to walk around this field in one direction, we'll ask this lady, will we go left or right first? Left or right? Right. Right. Okay, so we'll try and go down through the set of gates on the right down there, across the bottom of the field, and back up to us through the set on the left, just with the sounds that you've heard. Okay. And I must warn you before I start this, this can go very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Hey down, hey down. There's always one. <laughs> hey down. So that's how we move sheep around. So anything up to about two kilometers, the dogs will try and guide the sheep and we try and direct the dogs. Okay. Those of you in the group will understand. If anything goes wrong like this during the week, you always blame the driver. <laughs> I'll take the blame for that. Okay. That's how we move the sheep around. Anything two kilometers, maybe a little more on a day like today, the dog will direct the flow. Okay. Once we gather the sheep, I'm going to move these sheep over and back in front of you a couple of times. If these sheep are facing to your right, you won't see much paint or color on them. But if they're facing to your left, you will see a red X on their side closest to you. That red X, come by, lay down, come by, lay down, the side of those sheep, lay down, 
So every farm has a mark on their sheep, and the mark for this farm is this red F on the sheep's left hand side. From now to the time you leave me this morning, you're going to realise that farmers never stretch their imaginations too far. My surname starts with F. <laughs> That's where that F came from, and that has been on this farm for generations. And it's specific to the colour, the place, and the shape. If that F was on the other side of the sheep, they belong to a different farm. If that was a green F, another different farm. Some people just have a line on their sheep. Some people have one dot or two dots or three dots on their sheep. Some farmers, as you've probably seen, love paint, painting their sheep and they just cover them in paint. They're like one big dot. But it is specific and it's not for me to know my sheep. I know all of my own sheep just to see them. All their faces are different. The horns on all their heads are different. The wool on every sheep is different. I know all of my own sheep to see them. But everybody else in this area knows that these are mine just by that F on their side. So if somebody brings some of mine home by mistake on the mountain, they know they're mine by that F. They can ring me up and say, Martin, I have some of your sheep here. I'll leave them back in a few days. If some of our poor neighbours around us have some of their gardens eating their lovely flowers, unfortunately they'll know they're mine by that F. And they can ring me up and say, Martin, get your sheep out of my garden. Everybody... Sometimes they're a little angry and there's another F in the middle of that. <laughs> that that's why there's colours in the sheep. When the dogs gather the sheep every day to check on them, they'll gather everybody's sheep. Okay, the next job we do is separate out the sheep that aren't mine. It takes me enough time to look after my sheep. I don't want to be looking after everybody else's. And on this farm at this time of the year, there's about 600 adult sheep and about 850 lambs. It takes me enough time to look after them. And even with them, if some of my sheep need my care or attention, instead of working with hundreds of sheep at the one time, we will try and separate the sheep that we need to look after and leave all the rest of the sheep alone. Okay, so I'm going to try and show you how we separate the sheep. Obviously all of these are mine. There are 10 sheep here at the minute. So to try and show you how we separate the sheep, we're going to try and reduce this number down a little bit, just to show you how we would do it if we had to. This gentleman picked me any number between 1 and 10. Three. Three. Another number between one and ten, not three. Six. Six. Six and three. What we're going to try and do is, we're going to try and reduce this group of ten down to those numbers. So we try and reduce it to six first of all. We try and keep six here, sheep here in front of you, let the others go. And afterwards we try and reduce that six down to three. Okay. This is with the help of Mo. I've worked with sheep and dogs my whole life. There's two things I've never figured out how to teach the dogs. Number one is how to read the F on the side of the sheep. <laughs> and number two is how to count. Okay, so I'll be on one side of the sheep, she'll be on the other. And when I say the word this to Mo, she should help me to separate. Okay, so we try and start with six first of all. Lay down. Come back. Lay down. Six. So once I said this, lay down, Mo's full attention is on these. Lay down. Okay, the next number we had was three. Lay down. Come by. Lay down. Come by. Lay down. Come by. Come by. Lay down. Lay down. We. We. Lay down. We. We. Lay down. Lay down. Lay down, wait, wait, wait. Lay down. Wait, wait, wait. Come back, sit. Come back, lay down. Lay down. I've said this now, Mo will put all her attention back on these three. Sit, sit. Okay, 
Lay down, lay down. So that's how we separate the sheep. Okay, sometimes then we need to do the opposite of that. Lay down more. It can take days and days to gather the sheep on the mountain, which means if we forget any sheep or leave any behind, it could take another day to go back and get any sheep we've forgotten. So if the dogs go up the mountain and they're coming towards us with some sheep, but I can see that they've forgotten some. We try and teach the dogs to check around them to see if they can see more sheep. So if they can, they can go back and get the sheep they've forgotten and bring all of the sheep down at once. Okay. Keep a very close watch on Mo. Her full attention should be still on these three sheep. But in a second, I'm going to ask her to have a look around or a check around. This, 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 this. Can you all see her? This, this. Look, look. Look. She'll go for the sheep that are behind her and she'll end up bringing whatever sheep she can find right back beside her. And that one little thing of asking her to look around like that can save a whole day on the side of a mountain. Not so important for me. I don't know if Mo can get tired, but she's much less likely to get tired going up the mountain once as opposed to doing it several times. Lay down, lay down. <laughs> and that's the working at the bottom. Lay down, lay down. Lay down. Hope you enjoyed that little bit. We're not finished yet. First of all, we're told one dog can do the work of seven or eight people on the farm. As you can see, I can completely agree because I've been standing here and she's been doing all the work. And other than that, you all know that Ireland is noted for these green mountains and hills that you see all around you. When you think about it, the mountains are only green because the animals are up there. If they weren't up there, the mountains would all be overgrown with trees and bushes and weeds of all kinds. The animals keep them grazed down. We have parts of Ireland, years ago the government in Ireland thought the mountains were being abused by having the animals on the mountains. So they bought back little bits of mountains and took all the animals off. We now have the army in Ireland in cutting down the weeds that have grown. <laughs> started bushfires and forest fires and all other problems. So the animals maintain the landscape that live Without the dogs, we couldn't have them. They play a huge role and that will live our lives and we can think of them. I hope you've enjoyed that little bit. I've shown you us chasing the sheep around. I suppose the big question that is left that I haven't answered is why do we bother chasing the sheep around? So there are some very weird and funny looking sheep both inside and outside. I'm going to give Mo a very quick drink of water. I'm going to move inside those pens and hopefully those sheep in there will help me explain why we keep the sheep and all the reasons that you see for the sheep. I hope you enjoyed this little bit. Sheep. They're just short of 3 million adult female sheep. In the springtime they will have somewhere over 4.5 to 5 million lambs. That's not including the ones we were chasing around outside with Mo there. They're lambs that were born on this farm last year. So there's millions and millions of sheep in Ireland. 99% of lamb production today worldwide, not just in Ireland, is for meat. There is no real other way to make money from sheep but you can see those sheep outside we were chasing around they're not very big they're not very meaty it's hard to produce meat sheep on the side of a mountain so I produce breeding stock here for other farms I sell most of my lambs to other farms and they will go on to produce meat lambs on the farms that we sell them to everything has changed my grandparents kept sheep on this farm and they made most of their money from wool this is one piece of wool from one of our sheep so they made most of their money from wool. Three years ago on this farm, my full income for one year's wool was 134 euro and 50 cent. Wow. Okay. We might have spent it on a good night out this week. <laughs> <laughs> for the last two years, and this year will be the same, I can't give this away. Okay, if I put it all in a trailer, drive to my nearest wool merchant about an hour away, they'll have a look at it. If they like the look of my wool, they might give me three or four cent per kilo. We're talking about six or eight cent per sheep. If they don't like the look of my wool, they'll send me home with it again. Okay, so we just don't go. Okay, there's no point. Why is that? Well, the first big answer to that is I should be wearing wool, and I'm not. <laughs> we all stopped wearing wool many, many years ago. So the clothing industry for wool fell apart a long, long time ago. 
I know well by the look of some of your faces, you're thinking to yourself, he's telling me that's worth nothing. And I see garments in a shop that's going to cost me an arm and a leg if I want to buy a scarf to put around my neck. I'm learning too, and the people that are still in the wool industry have upped the prices. But I can tell you there's very few people of my generation in the wool industry. I can't see anybody after us going into the wool industry. I had a lady here visit me a few weeks ago. She was celebrating her 96th birthday. She worked in a very famous shop in Donegal called McGee's. It's one of the main names in Ireland for wool products. She was asked to return from retirement to that McGee's three times. So three times she went back to work to train people how to work with the wool that she had done all her life. And three times she did that, the people she trained all left the wool industry. She has six daughters. None of them are in the wool industry. None of them have any interest in it. So at 96 years old, nobody has been passed on the craft and gift of working with wood. So it, that's what has happened. It's just dying off slowly. And the people that are surviving have up the prices to try and survive a little longer. But it's only my opinion, but I would say in a few years' time here, there won't be a wool industry in Ireland. Okay. For more than the last 20 years, most of the wool worldwide is sent to China. It's used in insulation for buildings, carpets, bedding, lots of cheaper forms of use. But wool is flammable. It will self-extinguish eventually, but it will burn. And while it burns, there comes toxic fumes off it. So to put wool into buildings is just not viable at the minute. It's costing too much. So there is no market for wool. Okay. In here, as I said, are some weird looking sheep and some outside too. And hopefully they'll explain, help me explain how the sheep have changed. Over here, we have these black and white sheep. Some of them outside as well. This one has three big spiky horns on top of her head, three little ones at the side. This lamb standing up has four horns. The one lying down has three horns. These are called Jacob sheep. They're always black and white like this. They can have anything from two to six horns on their head. And they were the first ever breed of sheep on earth. There were drawings of them in the Bible. So they predate the Bible. We don't know where they came from. But they were the first ever sheep. As far as we know, they came to Ireland on those Spanish Armada ships back in the 1500s. They were on those ships as a form of meat, and when they ran aground, some of them survived, and that's how they came here. Okay, so they were the first ever sheep. The sheep lying down out the front here, as time moved on, the main reason to keep a sheep was for their wool, and I know she looks very ordinary at this time of the year. That's a, just a lamb that was born on the farm last year. She's not fully grown yet. She was only sheared a couple of weeks ago, but already you can see these thick, long, curly fibres returning to her body. That's a fleece of wool from our sheep today. This is the wool that we got from her. Oh, it's oh, completely wow. different. It's like a soft mat on the inside, and it's like dreadlocks on the outside. These <laughs> thick, long, curly fibres. When Before she was sheared, that was all down her face, all down her legs. That's only a little bit of her fleece. Instead of two to three kilos of wool, that sheep gave us eight or nine kilos of wool. Perfect wool for making clothes. So some sheep were bred just to produce lots of wool. This black sheep is called a Zwartzblas sheep. Zwartz is the Dutch word for black. Blas is the Dutch for the blaze on her face. Zwartzblas sheep came from Holland originally as a milk sheep or a dairy sheep. People used to use the milk to make cheese or they used to drink it directly from them. Okay. As I mentioned earlier on, farmers and stretching their imaginations, there was a story from the Bible about Jacob and his sheep. So we have Jacob sheep. This is called a Teeswater sheep from a place called Teesdale in the north of England. Zwartzbless, black with the blaze. Names are very original. The sheep we're chasing around outside with mo. They're the most common breed of sheep you'll see in Ireland. They originate in Scotland. They were bred for living on mountains and they have black faces. There went huge thought, time, effort and imagination into naming them. They're called Scottish Mountain Blackface Sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Very original. Okay. So that's the first ever sheep, wool sheep, milk sheep. And this is a fully grown adult sheep and her two lambs. And this is called a soy sheep. These were bred for their meat. Soy sheep came from an island off the coast of Scotland called... Soy. Soy, Island. <laughs> Soy Island didn't have green fields like we have. They had lots of very steep cliffs. So they bred these tiny little sheep so that they'd be able to climb up and down the cliffs. And they lived and still can live on just seaweed. They don't need anything else. Wow. They were the only meat source that the people on Soy Island could keep. They couldn't keep any bigger 
breeds of cattle or sheep they couldn't survive on the cliffs so these were their only meat source okay today there aren't any people on soy island or islands like it so we don't need tiny little sheep like these to give us meat we don't need a sheep to give us milk we have cows and goats all over the world to get most of our milk from we don't need a sheep to give us wool it's not worth any money and we don't need a sheep to look completely ridiculous <laughs> on the top of their head. again not worth anything all of these breeds in here were almost extinct at different times they're all still classified as rare breeds today unless a sheep can produce meat nobody wants them okay which is making all of these sheep being driven driven out there's a little sheep she's hard to see at the minute the sheep along the hedge on the left hand side the little gray sheep with the white face that's called a herdwick sheep herdwick sheep are born completely black to camouflage themselves into the landscape after a couple of days their ears go white after a couple of weeks their face goes white after a couple of months their legs go white and when they get to about five or six years old they turn completely white they were down to surviving on just one farm in england in the 1940s and 50s and the lady that owned the farm realized she had the only remaining flock of herdwick sheep in the world and set about trying to save them i would bet that most of you have heard of her her name was beatrix potter the lady that wrote peter rabbit okay she had the only remaining flock of herdwick sheep and she set about trying to save them even in the will of her land one of the conditions was the people that inherited her farm must try and breed and save herdwick sheep she was completely successful thankfully that now getting popular again but all of these breeds in here were the same i managed to rope a few friends of this in, into this many many years ago so we try and keep as many of these rare breeds among us as we can just to try and keep them alive they're completely worthless, but if they ever disappear, a little bit of our history will disappear with them, and it'll show you how things have changed. And just to prove that I can't train sheep. <laughs> Folks, I hope you've enjoyed all of that. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Or if over the next few hours, days, weeks, months, after you get home, if you're looking through those pictures or videos, or if memories come to mind, if you have any questions at any time, you can send them on to me even after you leave and I'll try and answer them for you if I can. To find my details, if you just look up Atlantic Sheepdogs, very easy to remember, another farmer with no imagination, that's the Atlantic, hopefully you'll remember the Sheepdogs bit. If you look up Atlantic Sheepdogs, my mobile phone number, email address, Facebook page comes up there, send me on any questions or pictures or whatever you want to do. Enjoy the rest of your trip. I really hope you enjoyed that. My one last request is, can I get a hands up from whoever brought this sunshine with you? Because you're staying here. Be careful. If you're the one that's bringing the sunshine, you're staying here for six months. You don't get weather like this. Okay. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest.